This is Overlap, and I am Eugene Per Year, and we are very happy to be joined for you again by another episode of what is a show that is a partnership between us here at Breakthrough News and our good friends at Wave Media in China, where we're talking about all of the issues where our cultures overlap, where they diverge, and how they can come closer together. I'm really, really happy to be joined again here by Chris Young, who's an editor of Guangxia News. Chris, thanks so much for being back with us here. Thank you, Eugene. It's my honor. Well, I'm really glad that we're here talking about Wandering Earth 2. Now, for anyone here in the U.S. who has Netflix, a lot of people have seen Wandering Earth 1. Wandering Earth 2 has just come out. I watched it recently. Uh, I'm a big sci-fi nut, so, you know, as you can imagine, I am very into these things. But I guess my, my first thing I wanted to get into here when we're talking about, uh, you know, anything sort of cultural is how it's being received, um, you know, in terms of the primary audience. So I'm a little curious just to hear, you know, this was a huge sensation internationally, the first one. How is Wandering Earth 2 really landing with Chinese audiences? What's the conversation that it's creating, if any, uh, in terms of its its broader effect? Well, um, to be honest with you, uh, the Chinese movie market is roaring back nowadays. As you know, China just uh, reverts to its uh, COVID policy. And a lot of moviegoers been going out to see films during this past Chinese New Year holiday period. It was a seven-day holiday period. And the cinemas were packed. Okay, I went to see it on the last day of the holiday, and, and it was packed. I went to see two films. One was uh, another historical comedy or historical drama directed by the famous Chinese director Zhang Yimou, and it features a star-studded cast. And the other one is The Wandering Earth 2. And uh, both films are very long, uh, especially The Wandering Earth, which was about three hours long, a little less than that. It's, it's sort of like the young generation wants to claim that their preference, their taste, their aesthetics to be taken seriously and to be reflected by the market and to be commercially rewarded according to its worth. So a lot of when it was premiered uh, back in, I think, the first day of the Chinese, hot, uh, Chinese New Year period, there was a commentary uh, by some, uh, some uh, opinions writer called Brandon Yu, I think, uh, on New York Times, said that this story is um, uh, undercooked, uh, convoluted, and, uh, you know, it's, it's mostly criticism, okay, so, so it's, it's bad story. And you know, don't bother because they, you will not understand it. And a lot, that angered a lot of sci-fi fans in China. They say, okay, this is our, our darling, and, and you're insulting it. Um, and they were so angry. And, and I went to this cinema to see it. Okay, I think their uh, anger was somehow justified in a way because it was a good film. I feel it was a, it was, it was a good film. Um, but because it's a prequel to to the Wonder Earth One, um, it hap it's it, the story was about something happened before uh, the uh, Wonder Earth One story. So you need a certain level of background knowledge to be able to fully appreciate this, this film. And it's three hours long. At that long, it could get a little tiring for some audience, especially if you're not uh, really uh, that uh, that of mm -hmm. sci-fi nuts. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I read that New York Times review and I was just, you know, at first I was like, oh, my God, dismayed. I mean, obviously, anyone who loves movies, you know, sequels, you're always a little worried. But I was very surprised when I watched it. I was like, OK, well, this feels totally different than what the reviewer said. But OK, that happens all the time. I often don't agree with reviewers. But, you know, the thing that I and I really like the movie. I really like Wandering Earth 1, too. I mean, as as you know, as I said, I'm a sci fi nut. So it kind of hits all the right points and there's a lot of you know great allusions to other sci-fi films even a really interesting moment where there's a group of i think they were actually fighter pilots or maybe workers sitting along a uh, like a steel beam high up which is a very famous photo in the united states yeah. um and that's actually one of the things that i like about the film is it very much is leaning into the so i guess the geopolitics of it maybe right because the way china is presented to americans is 
that all Chinese people hate the United States, that there's, you know, it's an evil country that's trying to overtake us. I mean, all these negative themes. And I think it's interesting to hear what you're saying, that this is such a popular film because the whole premise of both Wandering Earths is all of humanity coming together to like solve these existential problems, which obviously feels very fresh because we're the pandemic, climate change. I mean, we actually are as a species facing all of these existential problems. And I think it's an interesting commentary that that did not make it into the New York Times um, review and that sort of sense of it you know, doesn't really come through because to me that might actually be the most important part of the film. And I think it's also partially why the first film was such a big international hit to the extent that, you know, Netflix is buying it and, you know, sending it around the world is that I think it, in a way, even though it's a Chinese film, it can speak to almost everyone because it does speak to this kind of deeper humanity about kind of where we are as a society, as a species. Um, and, and I think that's important. And I think that's also an important cultural moment for people in the U.S. to see. And it used to be there are a lot of movies like that in the U.S. You know, every disaster film, asteroid or whatever, it was all about the whole world has to come together, we're going to solve this problem, and it always works out at the end. But we're seeing fewer and fewer of those movies in America. I, I, don't, I don't really know exactly why. I don't want to say I have any real insight into it. But it does feel like, to some degree, it's reflecting the changes in the culture. Like, when I was a kid in the 90s, when, like, Armageddon, all that was coming out, you know, it was more the world is coming together, you know, globalization, all of this. Now, you know, the world is much more split, and it seems like Hollywood is reflecting reflecting it. So it was refreshing, I think, to see Wandering Earth 2 and to sort of be back in that mold of, I think, the best of sci-fi, which is it's talking about humanity as a species and how we come together as opposed to how we divide. I totally agree with what you said. Um, I just want to add, um, one of the criticisms that was leveled against the Wandering Earth 2 was it was too nationalistic. It portrays, you know, the Chinese as the ultimate savior, ultimate savior of the world. Only Chinese could save the world. When when one of the uh, ma major characters, Chinese official in U UEG, which is equivalent to UN, said, okay, trust our people. You, you need to trust our people. And a lot of them say, okay, you're, you're saying, okay, trust the Chinese. Okay, we are somehow the problem solvers and you are, you know, problem creators or quitters. But no, I think that was not the point. But overall, in the end, the United States and China, they teamed up together to save the world. All of the countries, when, when they asked, okay, pilots over the age of uh, 50, please step out. Pilots from different countries all responded to, to the call. Chinese, American, Russian, Singaporean, Korean. They all went to the moon to save humans from the crisis. So it's, it's really about international collaboration. Some of the um, jokes could be stereotypical. But I guess that's that's just um, harmless fun. We're we're just poking fun. We we poke fun of Russians too. We say okay, they they are the Zhan Zhan means the, the the fighting nation. You know, <laughs> they they didn't like that. I mean, in real life, they didn't like that. But so it's just, it's just a harmless fun. It's a joke, and I think it doesn't hurt. Um, the movie is about how humanity unite together to solve the crisis, which is precisely what I think. This film is the core of the film, and I think that is a little bit beyond my my wildest imagination. I can't imagine we all come together like that, especially yeah. if you look at the geopolitical reality that nowadays, okay, Russia and Ukraine is fighting a war, how European Union and America, uh, NATO played a part, in, and how uh, China and the United States how the United States is so um, nervous about a weather balloon flying up across its its its, uh, its territory, and all all that sort of things just make me feel a little bit surreal to see we yes we can actually do something good you know be it climate change be it solar flare whatever we can do something together and that is so surreal after three years of pandemic. We didn't <laughs> team up and solve anything. <laughs> we had a chance, you know. We 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 had a chance. Humanity had a chance. We, if we were together to solve that problem, like we come together for two weeks and quarantine, everybody just the disease could just be be starved starved out. I mean, <laughs> we 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 wouldn't have the pandemic in the first place. And that just feels a little bit. I don't know how to say. I don't know. Uh, and I feel especially when you have the 
equivalent to UN, the UEG, United Earth Government, to be responsible to uh, hold accountable for the future uh, generation. 2,500 years down the way is, and is a little bit surreal too. And people would actually listen to their governments. I wager that you know if that were to happen in real life. Within three days, people would rebel. I mean, it would be a world war and chaos <laughs> upon us. <laughs> I think that's a little bit exaggerated. I mean, uh, I, I don't see any of that it could be possible in real life. But still, being impossible in real life doesn't doesn't detract the value of it. It's sort of like the most beautiful thing that human as a species we can imagine. And, and I really appreciate that after three hours. And that's my key takeaway. I think that is the most beautiful part of that cooperative spirit is the most, uh, I don't know, it, my, my takeaway from the film. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely with you on the surrealness of it. And I think in a way, maybe that's why I think movies and literature or whatever like this can be important because it's sort of almost like we need to reintroduce the idea over and over again into people's minds that something different could be possible because it's you know so easy to look at reality and just kind of throw up your hands and say, okay, we could never do this. And it's almost like that preparatory work that has to be done to sort of start to shape people's minds into like, okay, yeah, like, yeah, this was just a movie. Yeah, it was just a story, but huh, I wonder what this could look like and what it could be. And I'm, I'm glad you brought up the scene you know, of uh, when the pilots step out and they come from all the countries and it's everyone over 50. I mean, there's so many different elements to that. I mean, one, you know, older people sacrificing themselves for the good and the future of younger people. I mean, that's, I think, a very universal theme throughout humanity. But then just to have all the different accents, the different voices all come through. And there's a great moment at the end of Wandering Earth 1, too, with a sort of similar sort of scene. I think some people always look at things like that as being a little bit corny, cheesy, stilted, whatever. But I liked it. It was one of my favorite scenes in the movie. Maybe my favorite scene. Maybe I have, oh, that's tricky. This very beginning scene with the space elevator, very good. But um, it's it just, it's a powerful moment because I think it speaks to like, that just that that spirit coming together and the cross-cultural friendships you know between the russian guy the chinese guy um you know you've got the i don't know i guess he was african black guy the american guy i thought in in, in many ways i kind of felt like it was also refreshing because most movies where someone saves the earth it's like america saving the earth and hey look i like some of those movies don't get me wrong but it is good maybe to see somebody else <laughs> slotted into that and maybe we should just like go around the world and just have like something where every country saves the earth or something but i thought that you know every movie of sort of i think all of our cultures hollywood nollywood and nigeria there's a certain element of that right because you're sort of centered on the people you're making the movies for but i also thought the main character you know in a way was sort of a nuanced character in that sense i mean obviously he's a chinese character but like he in a way causes the biggest problem and then comes back to sort of save the day at the end of the day. Um, and I thought that that is also just sort of like an interesting, you know, sort of character development showing that, you know, they want to complicate some of the characters and not make it that scene. But I also think there's also a value sometimes in everything not being that complicated and not being that, you know, sort of deep in terms of character development and things like that, because sometimes that's exactly what helps you step away and see some of these other bigger, broader themes in terms of how things play out. And I think that that in and of itself is is valuable. And and I think, you know, whatever, you can make different criticisms of this, that, and the third. But I really felt that it, it in a way, keeps you focused on sort of the main, what I thought was the main point, you know, of the original short story of both movies, which is to sort of help people imagine, you know, what humanity can do when we all come together. So, yeah, I think it's one of those questions, especially when we look at COVID, especially when we look at climate change, um, you know, that, you know, do we does entertainment, does art, does literature become like a or not become what? Is it a front in the battle of ideas? And to what extent, I mean, as much as, you know, I do the news, I'm all for the news, we wanna like tell people the truth, uh, but like to what extent do you have to take people outside of reality to help prepare the ground for like real change in international relations, geopolitics, local national politics? It does feel like this movie gets me in that mindset of thinking about how sort of quote unquote entertainment also plays a really important role, I think, politically and ideologically and how people actually see what could potentially be possible in our current world. Yeah. Uh, I think that's that's just what films do. 
And mm. I mean, as a cultural product, it's a product of our culture. It's a product of our collective consciousness, how we want to perceive our society and how we want others to see us, to remember us. This film has, is paying a uh, tribute to a lot of uh, Hollywood blockbusters. And you probably can, you can tell 2001 Space Odyssey. A lot of it. I can imagine, I can I can tell um, like the drone fights where 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 it feels like uh, the Independence Day where you have the fight fight planes uh, uh, fighting with uh, the alien invasion. A lot of American films were about bravery and infused with patriotism and also uh, space uh, you know uh, scientific progress. And those things come together to form a part of the national narrative of the United States. So it's most like an ethos of that era mm-hmm. where, where uh, you, you had to, you know, had to fight a Cold War to, to gain the upper hand culturally with the Soviet Union because remember, Soviet Union was so, you know, so artistic. <laughs> if you want to look at, you know, uh, classical art and also its paintings, socialist realist paintings. So United States has to make its own cultural products. And there's this criticism of old European old European countries. Uh, they say, okay, America is a, is a desert of culture. It's a cultural desert. The Americans are not sophisticated like the French, like the German. They don't think. <laughs> it's so stupid. But in the end, 90% of our culture products are made in the USA. We, we all consume that. <laughs> Everybody consumes that, like you know, superhero films. Mm-hmm. You call it superficial. You don't like. I don't like it, but that doesn't doesn't matter. Okay, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Our culture is so deeply shaped by you know that that sort of um, that kind of um, progress. You know, uh, optimism, that the drive, the kind of drive, and that that was America in in 1990, 1990. But slowly, I think, as you mentioned, globalization and people start to feel, especially after the financial. Uh, crash. People start to feel that their economic well-being was not; they were not kept afloat by by globalization. The, the wealth somehow didn't trickle down to them. People start to focus more inward. You know, ask the questions about their own, you know, livelihood, their uh, family, you know, emotional well-being, things like that. So what you have, you see. It, the, the more recent American films, sci-fi films, are more inward-focused. You ask questions about, in a dystopian society, how, how are we going to survive, or what is what it means to be human? It seems like that. It's not like you go out and venture out, you know, to see the brave new world, or things like that. But in, in China, things are different. This is, officially, it's, it's like one of the first blockbuster sci-fi films in China. Mm. The rest is just, you know, cheap. Uh, I, I don't call them sci-fi films. They're just like with a, with a sci-fi skin. But it, it, its core is, you know, a, a, a love drama, you know, um, not sci-fi films. So, so The Wanderness is probably in a, a bar. It's setting our bar very high. For the Chinese sci-fi fans, mm. and I don't know, I, I have an analogy. I don't know if it's appropriate, but America is like has experimented with this genre for so long, and the, the audience could be a little tired to see the American heroes going out to save the world. It's always Americans to save the world, but the Chinese people, we have never imagined ourselves to be in, in a driver's seat. Mm. <laughs> okay. We have never done that, and we're not used to it. And the global audience, probably some of them, is not used to that. Why the Chinese is claiming to to be the ultimate savior of the world? But previously, it has nobody questions Americans for doing that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I think okay, we 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 all need to get used to that. <laughs> but that comes to a, brings me to another point. I think sci-fi films, you know, science fiction is a fiction. But that mm-hmm. fiction just has a scientific setting. The core of the fiction is how we imagine our our world. Our imagination is actually a realistic extrapolation of reality, of now and past. We, we extrapolate to see what's beyond 
in the present with, of course, with a solid scientific foundation. And not every, every country has the ability to, to, to imagine the world with a solid scientific foundation. The ones you mentioned, you know, Bollywood, Nollywood, they all produce scientific uh, sci-fi films. They all, they all do that. But if you really look at the pictures, you dissect the pictures, what is that? Is that an exoskeleton arm? Is that credible? You know, the, the, the kind of impact, is that credible? If you look at the space shuttle, is it credible? Look at how they train the astronauts. Is it credible? You, you will find it, in, you know, uh, to be a little bit, I don't criticize them, but of course it's their imagination, but their imagination is not grounded in reality. And it's very important to, to for your imagination to be grounded in reality. And I think uh, China and America are probably one of the two, the two countries who has the ability to do, to, to do that, exactly that now. And I'm glad that China is has joined America <laughs> in, in, in that league. Yeah, no, I, I definitely, a, I that's agree. A very, that's a very exclusive club. <laughs> It's a very exclusive club, and it's hard to do. I mean, I mean, you know, to make it look good is difficult. And I think, you know, you look at a lot of sci-fi films from, you know, sort of emerging movie sort of scenes, not even just sci-fi, everything. You know, special effects is always kind of the giveaway. I think special effects and fight scenes are always kind of the giveaway to me of, like, how developed a movie industry is because it's very difficult to do good special effects, and it's very difficult to film a good fight scene from multiple angles and different ways like that. And it's, it's you know, one of those things that you can see. I've noticed that a lot in Turkish television over the past five or six years, how they've drastically improved in that sort of in those two realms and where because of that, you can see that their TV is becoming more and more popular internationally. And yeah, I think that you're, you're raising a very good point here about the role of sci-fi and how sort of sometimes just being able to suspend some basic you know, realistic elements of it sort of just help you move the story along and get to the story that you really want to get to. Kind of like in historical fiction, you know, sometimes people will take some liberties. I'm also a history nut, so that drives me crazy uh, when they don't do the history, right? But it's kind of the same thing, right? You know, you want to sort of get people to the general uh, point, which, you know, one other thing that I also think about when I think about Wandering Earth 2 that I think makes this very fresh and also a very interesting sort of cross-cultural moment in terms of what both Chinese people and American people are thinking about right now, and that is the role of artificial intelligence, which is obviously shot through throughout the movie. The ethics of artificial intelligence are, you know, right at the forefront. And right now, you know, in the U.S., this is this huge conversation with this this chat bot, the chat GPT, and what is this actually going to mean, and are machines taking over, and, you know, what's it going to mean for universities and colleges? Are kids going to start cheating on tests? And all these different things. And that, to me, was also a part of this that really grabbed me because this is like very much right now really even in like the past month become this huge conversation in the U.S. about like what are the real ethics of AI? What can it do? Even to have like a world like in Wandering Earth 2 where robots are doing so much of the work, like what does that really mean and how does that work and who controls them and all these different sorts of pieces that I thought is a really interesting thing because, you know, you only put stuff like that in a movie if people are really thinking about it. So I think it's really interesting to think that there seems to be a conversation happening even if it's not fully you know, coming together, both in China and in the U.S., I'm curious what you think about this, about the ethics of artificial intelligence, which I think is only going to get bigger as, you know, we, we get more advanced with all these things. But that was like leaving the movie, and that's like the allusion to 2001, A Space Odyssey, which as a movie I love, kind of like, yeah, like what does it mean to like be doing all this artificial intelligence? Like it, it, we need it in a way to move forward futuristically, but like what are the ethics there? Mm -hmm. Well, this is such a huge topic. I mean, this uh, definitely touches on uh, the ethics. And to me, to me, and I think to a lot of people, audience, the Digital Life Project was not that, you know, it's not an abominable, you know, when, when you think about it, when you, when their life can, you know, generate itself for 70 years, instead of like just a few seconds, when, when it has its own consciousness, when it can ask you questions and, you know, remember stuff. And it's it's another life, probably, if you look at it. But in China, 
the overwhelming perception of digital life, just just like in the movie, it says 91% of Americans that agree with digital life project, but the Chinese prefer the movie mountains project. Right. <laughs> okay. A lot of the young people, they, they don't, you know, from the bottom of their hearts, they don't agree with that mm-hmm. um, because there's this one line reflecting their sentiment is that civilization without people is meaningless. Uh, <laughs> Uh, from one of the characters. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yes, what it means to be categorized as a civilization, what it means, does digital civilization exist? Can you call digital civilization civilization or simulation of, of, uh, of humans? Um, that's arguable. And I, I see it's definitely going to cause trouble in the near future. Um, if policymakers are not, uh, you know, haven't decided it, uh, on the laws to regulate things like this, because it's going to, you know, take away a lot of uh, lower end creative uh, jobs. Um, oh, let me just not do, do too much on that. I, I recently I did a, a short episode on exactly generative AI, um, mm. which is uh, creative. Uh, to, to, to be able to create art and music pieces. I think in the end that our creative, our creation or creativeness will be, you know, the block letter create creativity, block letter creativity, the, only the big things, the, the, the biggest ideas. Then, you know, the small letter creativity, you know, how, how to design a logo, how to write a poem, how, you know, especially for journalists like me, you know, how to write a piece of news. Oh, my God, that's so AI. <laughs> okay, that's going to be replaced by, by the machines. Uh, and how are we going to deal with this situation? I think it's, the legislators, the decision makers in China are on their move. You know, they, they, they want to ensure uh, certain jobs. If you if you have the man, enough manpower to do certain, to do certain jobs, do not give it to the machines. Yeah. Well, that's a great message. <laughs> yeah, do not give it to the machines. But I think the overall trend is if you look at productivity, definitely we, we cannot compete with robots in AI. I'm a little pessimistic, but that film also gives you a twist. In the end, um, the Digital Life Project somehow that comes back and, and ultimately saves the earth. The two storylines ultimately converge. And I think that's just um, optimism. Let's, let's not call it blind optimism, but we, we got to figure out a way. Or otherwise, if you look at the, you know, the, the final ending part of the movie, the postscript part, uh, where Moss tells Tu Hong Yu, the scientist, that it was the the, the you know the evil schemer behind all those crises you mm-hmm. have gone through every each and every one of them, but somehow it, it, did you notice that the final date was set upon twenty seventy five um fifteen February twenty seventy five, and uh, I think in in the novel in the original novel, and also Moss said I caused the fourth crisis which was. Uh, the yeah, helium flash crisis, crisis no, 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 no. Yeah. the the helium, the helium, the helium flash crisis, something like yes. that, which which was in in the original novel the end of mm. the story. Uh, in, in the original novel, humanity didn't survive uh, mm. because okay, there was this uh, this this uh, uh, rebellious army, rebellious force. There was uh, this group of people think the overall project was futile, and nobody. Is going to be responsible. Nobody can imagine what's going to happen in 2,500 years' time. So they, they say, okay, these scientists and the government is cheating on us. Let's throw them out. So the scientists were thrown out to the ice-cold environment and the, the, they froze to death. And just as the, um, the the rebels celebrate, there was this helium flash that you know, it destroyed everything, which was a, it was a tragic ending. And I think that was, that was a re- more realistic. And then, <laughs> if, if you look at if you look at you know how how we deal with crisis uh, in a global crisis, but I think okay if if uh, Tu Hang Yu and you know in his digital 
in his digital life survived that crisis, somehow the digital life project played an important part in you know preserving humanity <laughs> in, yeah. in the end. So I, I think maybe maybe that's just um, our hope, uh, uh, best hope against future odds. I think. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point, and I, I definitely think that they're uh, they're setting up for a third movie. There, there's no, <laughs> no doubt about that. Um, I think by pushing that forward and kind of you know interestingly alluding to like the weird messages about the different years, perhaps coming from the artificial intelligence of the scientists in the future. Um, so that's interesting. But I, I agree with you. It's certainly the book ending does sound a little bit more realistic. It reminds me, um, there's a British filmmaker, Ken Loach, who is you know popular with progressive people here in America. He's made a lot of movies about progressive themes, but they always end really badly. But the thing is, is they always end totally realistically. So it's like, listen, you know, these are inspiring stories of the Irish Civil War, or union organizing, or whatever but like at the end of the day like i'm just giving you what has actually happened like there aren't fairy tale endings here and that in and of itself then becomes a conversation piece and those are all historical films but i think it'll be interesting to see if they go with the third movie will they try to go with a more hopeful ending or will they go with a more sort of realistic or some might call it cynical ending um you know i don't know which one will really be more popular but i do definitely think that that is i mean even the 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 sort of statement by the computer, which is, of course, very similar to HAL in 2001 A Space Odyssey, that like artificial intelligence becomes so smart that it views humanity as its own worst enemy. And I think that's an interesting sort of commentary on exactly what we're talking about in a way, which is, you know, in real life, we're seeing things that seem relatively basic, global hunger, global poverty, climate change, pandemics, that like, it feels pretty straightforward. Like, yeah, we should all be working together and figure out how to solve these things. They're all solvable, um, but we don't see that realism. Like, to what extent, you know, do we need to re-examine? I feel it's a nice mirror to kind of re-examine humanity. And I think that's why people liked 2001 A Space Odyssey, which is, you know, the 70s, where a lot of people in the U.S. are thinking, wow, we've been through this Vietnam War, we've been through the Civil Rights Movement, our country had all these problems, and, like, we're trying to emerge from them, and, like, what, what does that really mean? Like, how did we end up here? And I think the movie is sort of putting up a mirror and saying, are we our own worst enemy? And I think bringing that theme back in is also a way to reflect and to think about, okay, well, like, why is it that we're in this situation? Like, what are those roadblocks? And I think that's an interesting piece. And like you said, it also sort of ties into the the AI piece was saying, like, it's not necessarily a one or the other. It's not humans versus technology. It's about how humans can master technology, which, you know, we have in so many other ways. Uh, I mean, here we are, you know, the Internet, all these other things. Um, like, can we do that with some of these bigger problems? So it's like, I think in a way, you know, it's... <laughs> It, people say the same thing about, you know, here in the U.S. about Star Trek, about Star Wars in a way like it's so far off. But because of it being kind of out there, it actually does open up deeper conversations about, you know, where we are and what we can be doing. And I think that's one of the things I like about sci-fi. That's one of the things I actually really liked about this movie. It's why I really liked Wandering Earth 1, 2, why I was so happy it was on Netflix, because it has the ability to, I think, hit a lot of these cross-cultural themes in ways that anyone can relate to, but then also give those of us who aren't Chinese, aren't living in China, kind of a window into how Chinese people are seeing the outside world. Like I, you know, some people in the U.S. are always offended, you know, like how U.S. people are portrayed in different movies. I really like that. I like to see like, how do Americans come across to other people? Like, how are we looking? And you know, I think South Korean movies are probably like the most famous for portraying Americans in like very kind of ridiculous ways. Um, and I'm always like, well, that must be how we come off to them. And so I think it's like, in a way, it's good natured, though, you know, like the U.S. trainee, like he's kind of kind of loud, kind of boorish, kind of buffoonish, but like a nice guy, you know, and they all eventually kind of come together. And I think that, you know, it's the same thing with like the guy representing the U.S. and the U.N. Like at first he's kind of hostile, but then he's sort of like, well, let's you know, let me ask you what you think and sort of get these different pieces. And it's interesting to see sort of that perception like that there's. You know, both some might call it a caricature, but also a hopefulness in a movie, a popular movie in China that has some hopefulness about U.S. China relations, where I feel like, you know, everyone is trying to pull us apart from one another constantly. Um, and it's like we it, how do we constantly bring people back together? I mean, that's partially why we're doing this show, right, to have these people to people conversations. But I thought that's kind of an interesting kind of subcurrent of the movie, too. 
Mm. Yeah, so to- I totally agree with you, Eugene, on this. I hope we we make uh, films like this more often, and you know, to to make cultural products for the world, uh, you know, where everybody can consume, can understand, and appreciate, you know, because the underlying value, the core message, is you know shared by humanity across the world. It's not really China going out to save the world, because I I, I think um, even in Hollywood mov- movies, the most important message is not about how America play the world savior every time it's about the the you know the undying optimism that we must keep at heart to not despair at you know the challenges similarly um not able to overcome so it's it's really about human about people about how we should become the better versions of ourselves and also, also the, the, this one, the Wandering Earth, is exactly that. I think how we can become better versions of ourselves. And I think every every body is for if, even I'm not an avid sci-fi fan. I I totally get that message, and I I truly hope that more people will start to appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that's a great note to end on. And I think if you're watching this and you haven't seen Wandering Earth 1 and 2, definitely go check it out. Very fun movies. They're great for families. So, you know, everyone can see it. It's that kind of thing. Uh, I think you'll really enjoy it. We'll be very happy to see in the comments and things moving forward what other people think about this. But Chris, I always have a great time talking to you. Really appreciate the opportunity to just be able to exchange uh, on this front. And I think for Wave Media, for Breakthrough News, for me, Eugene Perrier, here, we we will see you on the next episode of Overlap. <laughs>